Hi, I'm Joe Saunders of Miniature Landscape Hobbies, and in this episode, we're going to look at how to paint characters from our British Napoleonics army. In particular, we're going to look at how to paint mounted British officers. Character models are the figures you center out for special attention in your collection. There could be any number of reasons to do this. Maybe you just like the particular model more, or you want to challenge yourself. But in wargaming, the character model treatment is usually reserved for generals or commanders that are more likely to draw the attention of your opponent or onlookers. The difference between a character model and a rank and file figure can be fairly subtle. Most people paint 28mm models using some form of layering technique. Usually on character models this involves more layers to keep the color transition smoother or more striking than on the other models in the army. Obviously more layers means more contrast and more contrast means more time so a character model will usually occupy more of a painter's attention than a regular trooper. Rank and file figures are painted as a compromise between speed and artistry because you usually have to paint a large number of them. And for Napoleonics, you have to paint a very large number of them. Character models though are a one-off, so they're a great option on which you can bide your time, showcase your skills, and test your artistic limits. In this video I do just that with some Perry brand mounted British kernels. Let's take a closer look at my process. As always I start by laying down a primer coat in black. This helps establish the depth and shades on the model and gives something for paint to stick to. Because I would like to accentuate the high points on the model, and sometimes it's hard to tell when you're looking at a model that's painted just black, I then go on and layer over a very light layer of light gray. I do focus er on areas on the model, such as the pants, where I'll also be following up with some white. Over top of that, I just give everything a light dusting of white. I go a little stronger at the pants, so that I can establish a base layer on which to put my later highlights. White's a particularly hard color to use, and I find that it's pretty difficult or time consuming to lay down base layers by brush, so I choose to use my airbrush. With this done, I go on to using one of my new toys, a wet palette. I get it prepared, and I load it up with some hull red. Because I want to create maximum levels of contrast on the red coats for the model, I decide to start with a very dark red color and work my way up. I go ahead and up apply the hull red over the jacket, and then I begin making it lighter. I do a mid-tone of red vermilion, and just gradually add more red vermilion to the mix. On a regular model, I might only do a quick layer of each, but here I go with a smoother gradient so that more and more colors layer over top of each other. Eventually I get to the point where I just do straight red vermilion, focusing on the areas where the light is hitting the coat directly, and then finally I go ahead and add some flat flesh to the mix. This gives sort of a peachy red color that I put on only the very most exposed edges and creases of the model. Flesh tones are actually a really good option for adding to reds for highlighting. If you use white, you get pink, and the pastel look just doesn't look right. Flesh tones seem to be a nice medium that gives you something in between a bright pink and a deeper red. With this complete, 
I'm pretty happy with the gradients on the red, but I figure it needs to be all tied together. So I go get out some red tone, and I paint it over top of the model. This settles into the creases and the depths and adds shade, but it also works as a filter by smoothing out the gradient between the different highlights. When it comes to painting models, I work with the age-old adage that you start with the largest areas and then move to the smallest areas. Generally, you start with the inside and move towards the outside. So the next logical thing in the progression working with this model would be to go back to the pants. I had already put some good foundation down using the airbrush, spraying the dark gray and then the white, but now I needed to make them that much more distinct. I got out some off-white and began highlighting. I went over the raised portions and the spots where the light would hit the pants directly. This did a pretty good job, but white is usually needing some specific attention in order to shade it. In particular, you really have to exaggerate the shading on white. So I went out and got out my Army Painter Dark Tone and thinned it down quite a bit with acrylic thinner. I almost never use this stuff straight out of the jar because it comes out very thick and usually way too dark. But if you cut it to about 25% shader to about 75% thinner, it generally works pretty well. I went ahead and brushed this onto the pants and then left it to dry. Once I did that, it had settled into the corners, the creases, and smoothed out the gradients between the different shades I had already used. So then, using a fine brush, I just went in and put on a final highlight of straight white. Now seemed like a good time to tackle the flesh tones. I find that Perry brand models are generally more of a true scale model. Their facial features aren't exaggerated to make them more of a caricature. This helps with the appearance of realism, but also limits the number of options you can do on the flesh tones. So rather than working up a lot of colors, I decided to keep it simple. I started by painting all the skin areas with a coat of flat flesh. Once this was done, to shade it, I simply just washed over it with flesh wash. The wash would take about half an hour to dry, so I moved on to the cuffs. In this case, I decided to use blue cuffs, so I got a Prussian dark blue, which is a very deep blue, and painted it onto all the blue areas. I then slowly worked the color up to a brighter tone by adding light blue gradually to the paint. By the time I got to the very edges of the cuffs, I was highlighting with pure light blue. This process gave me enough time to let the flesh wash dry, so then I went back and got out my light flesh as a highlight tone. I watered it down until it flowed quite smoothly, and then went back and painted it onto the high points on the face. This would include the cheeks and the nose. It just added that much more depth and realism to the look of the face. Now moving on to German dark gray, I began to work on the shako and the boots. German dark gray is a very, very dark gray, almost black, and it's a really good foundation paint for going on sections that, well, should be black. In miniature painting, you usually want to save pure black for the deepest crevices on the model, so the next best thing is a really dark gray. It also has the advantage that the dark gray works really well when you wash over top of it with a black ink wash. Now we come to the opalettes and cords, and these are a real staple on most Napoleonic miniatures. They're also pretty hard to paint. Usually these things were made of a gold or silver fringe, but I decided to use straight yellow. 
I find that putting metallics anywhere on my models that isn't a weapon just generally doesn't look any good. The problem here, though, is that, as you can imagine, yellow is extremely hard to work with. It's not very pigment dense, so it doesn't show up very well on dark backgrounds. To deal with this, I start by using buff. I go ahead and paint it onto the fringes and the cords where I would expect to find yellow. When this was done, I needed to add some depth to it, so I took out an orange ink and ran it over all the buff. I left this to dry, and it settled into the crevices. Now finally, I could get out the proper bright yellow and just go over the raised areas. With this done, I now had a suitably bright yellow braid that looked pretty good. It was time to start on the Scarlet Officer Sash, and I decided to start with a base of purple. I mixed up some red and blue until I had a deep purple, and then went ahead and painted it on. I kept adding more red, and eventually more flesh tones, into the, the purple until it became a deep scarlet. I highlighted this up until I was putting final top highlights on with almost pure flat flesh. This gave a really deep and compelling red color that I thought looked great. Now I poured a new reservoir of water for washing my brushes and switched to a different palette. This is because I was about to work with metallics. You don't want the fine grains of metallic material in your paint medium to combine with your other paint water or your other paints on the palette. I then took out plate mail and went in and painted the sword and all the other metallic parts. When this was dry, I got out a brighter shade of silver, in this case shining silver, and then just painted a true highlight over top of all of that. The model was now pretty much finished, I just needed to go back and line in. This process reestablishes definition around the fine details and helps build up more sharp contrast. I do this by taking out black acrylic ink, pour it out in a palette, and mix about four or five drops of airbrush flow improver into it. The flow improver breaks the surface tension on the ink and helps it flow better. Then with a really fine brush, I pick up the ink and go ahead and carefully deposit it into the deeper, darker areas on the model and on the crevices. I also run it around any of the fine details that I want to stand out. And when that's done, then this model is complete. Now, to be completely honest, I have to say, I wasn't really all that happy with the outcome of this model. I had some trouble with the definition, particularly on the face. That being said, along with this officer, I also painted two more, and I'm quite happy with how those turned out. Now you'll notice that we didn't cover the horses here, because they're a bit of a separate subject, and I've been asked plenty of questions about how to paint them. I'm going to do a separate video on that in the future. Go ahead and keep an eye out. For now, I've got a few new British officers to command my Napoleonic forces in Babel. That's it for this episode. I hope you liked watching it as much as I enjoyed making it. Please remember that Miniature Landscape Hobbies is supported entirely by its viewers. If you would like to assist with the production, please consider joining me on Patreon. I have many levels for my Patreons to subscribe to. You can get access to the STL files I use, and even receive painting lessons or terrain. If Patreon's not your thing, then how about you head over to my Etsy store? Any purchases you might make help support the channel. Thanks for watching. And see you next time. Remember to subscribe. And as always, remember to keep building life in miniature.